Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Linna. I'm a senior lecturer and director of law and technology initiatives here at Northwestern University. And welcome to our program this afternoon, Autonomous Systems Failures, Who is Legally and Morally Responsible, which is brought to you by the Northwestern Law and Technology Initiative and AI at Northwestern. Just tell you just a little bit about the initiative and AI at Northwestern. AI at Northwestern brings together faculty who are engaged in AI work across campus, including at eight different schools at Northwestern and 11 different educational programs. Then our Law and Technology Initiative is a partnership between the law school and the computer science department and external partners. And our vision is to build the law and technology community, share research and information, and gather feedback about practitioner needs. So we do a variety of things, including a class that I teach with, uh, with Chris Hammond, who's an AI professor here at Northwestern. We teach a class that has computer science students working with law students and teams to develop technology solutions for external partners at law firms, legal departments, uh, legal aid organizations, and government organizations. And so we're really pleased to bring this program to you today. And we have a, a great panel. I'm going to introduce our panelists here in just one minute. Uh, we're going to have initial opening presentations from each of our panelists, short ones, about eight minutes. But then we're going to have a significant portion of time that is devoted to question and answer for the program. So we really want you, our participants, to get engaged in, in this conversation. You'll notice that there's a Q&A button in the, in the webinar frame in Zoom. Please ask questions. Please post questions there. We're going to be monitoring, the, monitoring those questions and asking them of the panelists. But also upvote questions, and if you, you can also answer questions there. So we'd love to see a robust conversation going on there. If you think there's research or articles, anything that we should be aware of, please share that in the Q&A. There's also a really interesting question going on online please uh, use the hashtag NLawCS in any of your social media on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever, wherever you post social media these days. And please uh, tag our NLawBizTech Twitter handle. Well, so with that, I would love to introduce our, our outstanding panel today, Ryan Kahlo, Madeline Claire Elish, and Todd Murphy. So starting with Ryan, uh, Ryan is the Lane Powell and D. Wayne Gittinger Professor at the University of Washington School of Law. Professor Kahlo holds courtesy appointments at the University of Washington Information School, the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, and the Oregon State University School of Mechanical, Industrial, and Manufacturing Engineering. He has testified three times before the United States Senate and organized events on behalf of the National Science Foundation, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Obama White House. Professor Kahlo is a board member of the R Street Initiative and an affiliate scholar at the Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society, where he was a research fellow and the Yale Law School Information Society project. Madeline Claire Elish is a cultural anthropologist whose work examines the social impacts of AI and automation on society. She recently joined Google as a senior research scientist working on the ethical AI team. Previously, she co-founded and led the AI on the Ground initiative at Data Science and Research Institute, which uses social science research to inform future design, use, and governance of automated systems, of automated and AI systems. She has conducted field work across varied industries and communities, ranging from the Air Force, the driverless car industry, and commercial aviation to precision agriculture and emergency health care. Her research has been published and cited in scholarly journal, journals, as well as publications, including the New York Times, Wired, The Guardian, MIT Tech Review, Vice, and USA Today. She holds a PhD in anthropology from Columbia University and an SM in comparative media studies from MIT. And Todd Murphy. Todd Murphy is a professor of mechanical engineering in the Northwestern McCormick School of Engineering and a professor of physical therapy and human movement sciences in the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. He received his PhD in control and dynamical systems from the California Institute of Technology. His laboratory is part of the Neuroscience and Robotics Laboratory. His, interests, his research interests include robotics, control, computational methods for biomechanical systems, and computational neuroscience. Honors include receiving the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2006, membership in the 2014-2015 DARPA IDA Defense Science Study Group, 
and being a member of the United States Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. And so thank you to all of our panelists. Um, what I'm gonna do next is I wanna set us up just with really brief, just a couple of comments on, um, on the, the prompt that we kind of gave as we, as we set this program up. So the question we're really asking or talking about is, is who is legally and morally responsible when autonomous systems fail? And as AI is woven into more facets of life, we're asking who should be legally and morally responsible for failures and other negative consequences to individuals and society. And so the goal of this panel is to, to really begin, begin the discussion and explore legal, technological, and societal implications of assigning responsibility for autonomous systems failures. I should say continue the discussion, but of course there's discussion going on, but there's so much to discuss in this space. And, and so thanks to our panel for joining us. Uh, we mentioned the Uber case to kind of to, to set this up. And I wanted to walk through just a couple of slides on that. I did want to warn you, I have a picture here uh, of uh, the, the Uber accident of the driver immediately before the collision happened that we're going to talk about just to kind of set the stage. There's so many things we can talk about. And we wanted to begin with the Uber case as, as kind of a case study to at least begin the discussion here. Uh, so in 2018 in Tempe, Arizona, an Uber self-driving car that was part of a test fleet hit and killed Elaine Hartsburg, a pedestrian. Video of the vehicle's safety driver, Rafaela Vasquez, showed her looking down before the collision. Later investigations found that Ms. Vasquez was streaming The Voice over Hulu at the time of the collision. Uber quickly agreed to a settlement of civil claims with the pedestrian's family. An investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board revealed flaws in the vehicle's mechanisms and flaws in Uber's safety culture. The NTSB also found that the state of Arizona had a relaxed attitude to safety. While Uber was cleared of criminal charges in September, just a couple of months ago, the safety driver, Ms. Vasquez, was charged with negligent homicide. So we're gonna use that Uber case to kind of set the stage for our discussion today. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ryan Kahlo to get us started. Ryan. Okay, just want to make sure you all can see my screen okay. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, it looks good, Ryan. All right, and let me just make sure. Okay, um, so uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having this convening. Thanks for thinking of inviting um, uh, me and the other panelists. Um, what what auspicious con um, company. Um, and uh, so I want to talk about um, this central question of, you know, what happens, like what happens when there's a problem with software? What happens when there's a problem with software? And the truth is, is that if the software causes a harm that is not physical in nature, then the answer is not much, right? So if the problem is that uh, it loses your data, you know, your PowerPoint won't load, you, you mute yourself and you miss out on, a, on an awesome point you wanna make, you know, too bad. Um, you know, even if it's more serious than that, right? You, you're, a, you're a professional writer and you lose something that's worth a, a, a dollar a word because of a glitch, not much. But when it's physical in nature, it's a different question. So what happens when a problem with software has physical ramifications? So just today, literally today, um, the FAA decides to clear the 737 max um, after a long comprehensive process. Um, it took two years to ascertain precisely the contours of the problem, which was a mixture of a bad sensor, um, an, an automation problem wherein the bad sensor caused the plane to, to dive, and then a training failure where um, uh, many of the pilots didn't know what to do about it. Okay, um, but it was a long process, had enormous effects, and obviously we lost um, 346 people. But I want to take you back even a few more years and, and remind you of the sudden acceleration issue with, um, with, with uh, the Toyota. Um, that was an issue where, again, you know, 80, 80 or so people died 
um, and they trace the, these deaths back to a problem um, with, with seemingly with acceleration. And Congress asked um, Department of Transportation to figure out whether the problem was software, because it's an issue if like, you know, there are millions of cars out there with a software bug that causes them suddenly to accelerate. And at the time, um, the Department of Transportation didn't feel uh, up to it, right? And so they actually went and turned to NASA um, to, to look at this to look at this car. Now I just want you to just imagine that for a moment. I mean, you know, they go to NASA and they say, "Hey, would you would you mind taking a break from putting robots on Mars for a little while and look at this Toyota for us?" Right? But that's what NASA did. They looked at the Toyota. It took a long time, and they cleared it of. Of, of software problems. And they think that maybe it was about the sticky pedal or somehow even the carpet would get under, the, under that pedal and people wouldn't, ex wouldn't expect it. And then of course, uh, as Dan already mentioned and is kind of a, a, a prompt for our conversation, um, there was the Uber fatality in um, Arizona, which led the National Transportation Safety Board to do what it does, which is a highway accident report. And that was a pretty interesting detailed report. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that DOT looked to NASA for the Toyota, but felt competent to do the highway assessment themselves, or at least the National Transportation Safety Board. But they have very good engineers there, and they're very capable. And they found out some super interesting things um, about the accident, uh, a couple of which I've highlighted here. One, which is that the classification system in the car kept toggling what it thought um, that uh, uh, what, what it thought that the human being, um, Elaine um, Hertzberg, what it thought she was. And every time it toggled back and forth, it lost the trajectory history. And so in the seconds, you can see on the left there, you know, the, the seconds leading up to the accident, you know, Dan foregrounded for us what, what the human was doing, but this is what the car was doing, right? The car was mistaking what it was seeing repeatedly. Okay, and the other thing that they found was that there was this, you know, this culture of, of, of lack of safety. One of the things that stood out to me also listed here um, is that Uber had turned off Volvo's um, automatic warning, collision warning system, which of course would have detected um, Ms. Um, Ms. Hertzberg, would have, would have detected the decedent, but it turned it off so that it could have you know, its own systems be basically running the show, which is interesting if you think about it, because what it did there is Uber toggled away from a, a, a company that actually has a very, very good track record for safety and decided that it's going to um, uh, override that with its own with its own system. And my understanding is that they've since backed away from that. Okay. So what do these things have in common? Well, uh, uh, first of all, between one and 300 some odd people died before these problems were discovered. That's one thing that they have in common. Um, another was that in each case, it was technically non-trivial to figure out exactly what had happened. It took a lot of really smart engineers spending a ton of time trying to unpack what happened, okay? Um, and, and third, in all three cases, ultimately blame ended up shifting considerably away from the programmers toward people. People in their cars, you know, people um, uh, 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 doing this, doing that. You know, basically a lot of, I mean, now some, in each case there was blame that was laid at the feet of, um, of the programmers, but there also was a considerable amount of scrutiny. Hey, was this really pilot error? Did, why, why, why didn't the pilots do what they should have done, which is to, to take, disengage the autopilot and pull this thing out, you know? And maybe people were just, you know, getting their, 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 their scooching their, um, their, uh, their, their uh, uh, rug underneath the accelerator. Maybe that was going on. And, and, and certainly this driver, this driver of this car, she should have been paying attention and not listening to the voice, right? So that's another facet of it. Um, so look, the, the truth is, is that, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Right, people are not trying to make unsafe machines. I, I get that, and, and in fact, a lot of processes go in, are in place to ensure that machines are as safe as the folks making them can make them. And they're imperfect. Right? We understand that. I mean, particularly aviation has an amazing track record, and so we can't use a couple of crashes to to impugn the whole uh, enterprise. Um, but I, I do think that one of the things that comes out to me so clearly is that. Um, 
society and especially societal institutions can get need to get a heck of a lot better human computer interaction. We need to get a lot more sophisticated on what happens when you put these complex machines into a picture with multiple human beings and with other machines. Okay. And the kinds of things that I, I, I think that we need to bring in to transportation for, for folks who work in that field from on the regulatory side or lawyers in that field or not, is we need to bring in some of the insights that have actually existed in this whole world where, again, digital harms are not quite as often as compensated, but as a whole robust system that needs to be brought in better. And one of those things is threat model. Um, and so for the picture I have you looking at all this time is an artist's uh, uh, sort of um, conceptual project uh, where he created a trap for autonomous vehicles where they, 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 they drive over it. And then when they get in there, they can't go anywhere because it looks like it's all a lane and there's nowhere for them to go. And so he sort of trapped them. This is an artist, right? You know, but that's, that's like something that people will start to do. A team out of Tencent, out of China, Tencent Research showed that you could trick a, a Tesla into changing lanes just by putting a couple of stickers on the ground that wouldn't even be detectable to people. Um, a team at University of Washington showed how you could slightly perturb um, a, a stop sign and make it look like a speed sign, right? Um, and so the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, there's going to be a lot of even purposive action out there, but there's also going to be weird stuff like mud on a stop sign that happens to do something, right? We need a lot more threat modeling, a lot more what could go wrong, what's the worst case scenario, especially when it comes to human computer interaction. The other thing is we need as much as possible, a lot of legibility, which just means that these systems need to be as transparent and readable as possible so that the folks who are doing the kind of, um, you know, the, 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 that are trying to figure out how the systems work in order to make them more resilient and better, they, they need to be, um, they need to be um, able to understand what's going on and, and have it not be hiding behind something proprietary and the like. Um, and the other thing too, is that, um, you know, just as with open security, uh, is this concept that if you have open source, sort of very open systems, they might actually be more secure from a cybersecurity perspective because more folks can get in there and, and take a look at what's happening. You know what I mean? Then that that is also a culture that we might want to import in, in more and more into transportation. And I'll end on this because I want to make sure that there's time for everybody else, right? But um, is that we need to be really proactive about that kind of accountability research. We need to bring people in who are going, who are not invested in the companies who are going to come in there and they're going to assess what happened. And the last example I want to leave you with is an example um, where the ICCT discovered that Volkswagen had a, has a, def, a defeat device in its, in its emissions um, uh, system so that it pretended to be more fuel efficient when tested than it really was. That's not anything a regulator figured out on its own. It's not anything the company admitted. There's no whistleblower. These folks actually took a bunch of cars and then tested them out on a hunch. And sure enough, that's what they found. And they published a methodology, which you can see here. Um, so we need to have a really healthy ecosystem of accountability, given the, the stakes, which are literal human lives. So I'll stop there and turn it over to um, the next speaker. Great. Thanks you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, we already have a lot of great questions coming in. I encourage people to keep posting your questions for our discussion. Uh, in the meantime, let's turn things over to Madeline. Madeline, I'll give you a minute to share your screen and, and pull right. your slides up. Let's let's see here we go okay hey Let's can go. everyone see it okay yes great all right all right um uh so yes um hello and i'm so so glad to be here and really honored honored to be here with such an amazing panel um as i said i recently joined uh google research i have uh, a lot of the work i'm going to talk about was conducted while i was at data and society and also just want to be super clear since this is you know a law school a room full of lawyers i'm not speaking on behalf of google in any way shape or form these are my own personal opinions as a as a researcher um so I wanna, uh, in, in this talk, I, I wanna sort of talk about some of the context and the role of social histories around perceptions of autonomous technologies. And I wanna start back in 1958 when cruise control was actually first introduced uh, in the Chrysler Imperial model. 
It was heralded as a you know super advanced luxury feature, uh, and it also became you know one in a long line of technologies that were described as mere steps away from making the human and human control obsolete. In fact, in a review of the feature in 1958, the year it was released, Popular Mechanics headlined the review with, like it or not, the robots are slowly taking over a driver's chores. The newest one is this, um, is this autopilot or is this cruise control? And in fact, uh, some decades previous to that, and almost 104 years ago to the day, the New York Times reported on a new advancement in flight stabilization technology, that is an autopilot, um, with the headline proclaiming this new device makes airships foolproof. Now we can shrug off these headlines as you know being overly optimistic, almost silly um, in their pronouncements, but they are emblematic of a very serious and persistent theme in the history of technology. That while advances in automation and more recently AI promise to do away with the human, to make the human obsolete, um, this almost never happens. This myth of technological perfection never comes true. And in fact, when we look to the history of automation and AI, we see these technologies do, do rearrange and reconfigure how humans work together. They often do so by obscuring the essential labor and human input that is actually required to make the technology function in the world. And this creates a consistent pattern um, in which the capabilities of technologies are overestimated by individuals, by designers, by the press, you know, by society at large. And this overestimation of the capacity of the machine comes at the expense of underestimating the role played by humans in operating the system until something goes wrong, actually until an accident happens. And at that point, the dynamic flips and the technology recedes into the background and focus turns to the nearest human. How does this refocusing occur? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, a few years ago, uh, the question who is responsible when someone is killed by a driverless car remained a hypothetical. As a way to anticipate what we might see in the future, my research colleague and I tried to ask this question to look at this refocusing of responsibility. Um, and we wanted to know that is how responsibility and liability change with the introduction of proto-autonomous technologies like cruise control and aviation autopilot. In our research, we looked at the history of accidents um, involving aviation autopilot approximately from 1950 to the present by reviewing court cases, um, as well as official government reports and popular news reports surrounding these accidents. The role of media coverage was, was um, uh, an important factor in our, in our work. And through our analysis, we noticed a consequential pattern conceptions of legal liability and responsibility did not adequately keep pace with advances in technology. While the control over flight in this instance increasingly shifted to automated systems, responsibility for the flight remained focused on the figure of the pilot. We even looked at a series of other high profile accidents involving aviation and nuclear power, and we saw the same dynamic again and again. The nearest human operator um, being blamed, even when they were in many ways disempowered to act within the system, whether this was information asymmetries and poor design in the case of the Three Mile Island, um, nuclear melt, uh, partial nuclear meltdown to complex, complex cascades of automation induced errors, including the so-called automation paradox um, from de-skilling and challenges of handoff design in aviation aviation, specifically looking at the, the Air France Flight 447 crash. We thought that this series of patterns was um, significant and we wanted to call attention to it. So we called it a moral crumple zone. Um, a moral crumple zone for us was a way to call attention to this uh, obscured and at times unfair distribution of control and responsibility that seemed to be arising in complex and highly automated or autonomous systems. 
Just as the crumple zone in a car is designed to absorb the force of impact in a crash, the human in a highly complex and automated system may become simply a component, accidentally or intentionally, that bears the brunt of the moral and legal responsibilities when the overall system malfunctions. Unlike the crumple zone in a car, which is made to protect the human driver, the moral crumple zone reverses this dynamic, allowing the perception of a flawless technology to remain intact at the expense of the human operator. The technological component remains faultless and unproblematic while the human operator is isolated as the weak link. And unfortunately, something very similar uh, is what happened when, when, we, when the Uber um, accident that is the kind of uh, centering um, piece of this conversation occurred. Um, after the initial hours of reporting, which focused on the safety of self-driving cars and Uber, the media narrative quickly changed from focusing on the driverless car to focusing on the safety driver. Uber resumed testing its vehicles on public roads nine months after the accident. And as Ryan and Dan mentioned, um, have been cleared of all criminal wrongdoing. Rafael Vasquez, the purported safe, the safety driver of the purported autonomous technology, um, as again, we've also discussed, was, was charged with uh, negligent homicide earlier this fall. From my perspective, the concept of a moral crumple zone is more than a fancy word for a scapegoat. It's, a, it's useful because it provides language to point out the particular ways in which responsibility for the failures of complex systems with distributed operations may be in, incorrectly attributed to a human operator or disproportionately um, uh, attributed to a human operator whose control is actually limited and moreover, the term provides language to talk about potential harms and failure modes that may escape a regulatory eye. Because this isn't only about issues of liability, this is also about safety and how to configure complex systems that work well out in the world. Um, because what we see in, in these stories and what I think will be a theme is that, you know, human in the loop design is often called upon as a means of control and agency, but this doesn't always work out in reality because it matters a great deal how the human is positioned in the loop and whether they are empowered or disempowered to act. So whether this is about understanding driverless cars and liability or whether this is about how we need to think about prescribing regulation for AI broadly, uh, human in the loop can't be the conclusion. It needs to be the beginning of a more specific conversation around how control and responsibility are fairly and appropriately aligned. I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you, Madeline. And okay, well, we're going to turn things over to Todd. Todd Murphy will let you get your slides up and take it away for your presentation. All right, um, I'm going to ask just like everyone else did. Can everyone hear me? Okay, yes. perfect. All looks good. And so I'm Todd Murphy, and I uh, I'm a professor at Northwestern University, and my group focuses a lot on interactive technologies um, and active learning and emergence, all as different interact different interacting components of things that show up in autonomy, and. As, as so, the, the role that I'm sort of playing in this panel is that of the technology person that knows and is involved somewhat, at least, in the development of algorithms that are supposed to achieve autonomy and achieve AI outcomes. Um, but you know, I think one of the first things that's worth pointing out is that human-machine interaction involves humans, and that none of us would say that humans are easy to understand generally. Um, we develop robots that specifically involve human machine interaction where there's physical interactions. And on the, on the right here, you see my graduate students physically interacting with a variety of robots. But just generally, people are hard, it's very hard to learn people's behavior. And that's partly because it's hard to infer what they want and what their intentions are. Um, and ultimately, this comes down to the fact that, that people are complex. 
Um, the other thing is that phys specifically physical human machine interaction is challenging because goals are very hard to specify in engineering terms. That, that is that the language that we use in engineering tends to be a language that's suitable for applications like manufacturing or applications like getting an airplane to fly at a particular altitude. And those goals are not necessarily particularly well aligned with the way a person perceives what they want to do and the terms in which they want to do it. The other thing is that I think is often easy to underestimate is that people will work against the machine even if they understand what it's intended to do. And we see this in lots of settings, particularly in assistive devices where people actually want the device and they want the device to help them with whatever they're doing. But their mental model of what the device is supposed to do and the way the device actually works are not necessarily aligned. And as soon as that dissonance occurs, then people will sometimes work against the machine. Even more so, and I actually want to point out that, that this is related to what Madeline was saying a moment ago, that the intended users of a device often will misuse the machine. And I think that part of the reason for that is that we don't, we, we are rarely satisfied with a new technology that just makes things easier. Instead, what we want is we want a new technology to expand our capabilities. And so we tend to stress test it without even thinking about it, pushing it up against the limits of what it can really do, and certainly beyond the limits of what it was intended to do. Now, the other thing that my group does is we spend a lot of time and effort thinking about how we should automate data collection. And I think here, a key idea is that there's a there's potentially a conflict between big data and the right data. In machine learning and in AI in general, we really focus on existing data sets, data that we happen to have rather than the data that we need. And that data collection is typically passive um, and passive data collection unsurprisingly contributes to bias because the data that you're collecting often is coming from whoever happens to of their own accord be interacting with the autonomy. So in my group here on the right, you see uh, a, a simulation of a person in a virtual environment that um, where we were interested in how drones might model the information needs of a person and automatically collect data and process it so that that person can make better decisions in a complex environment. And actually then down below, uh, uh, one of my graduate students is using a touch screen interface that uses the same algorithms to request from this swarm of drones what uh, data the person might want. But in both of those, the idea is that the autonomy, either a single agent or the group of agents, becomes responsible for acquiring the data that will be that will inform decision making or, inf or inform learning. Um, so Certainly in the context of what we're talking about today, automating data collection is also gonna be needed for safety verification. That as we have autonomy interacting with increasingly complex environments, the data that's relevant to understanding safety is gonna change. And so we're gonna to need to be able to automate active learning if we're gonna rely on AI and safety critical applications. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is tech culture and industry responsibility and how these two things interact with each other in the way that I see it sort of playing out in our uh, interactions with companies that we work with and with the research that we do. So at both academia and industry overwhelmingly focus on positive results. We like to say when things do work and we like to interpret everything that works as a success. Um, and this has really been going on since Charles Babbage's analytic engine when in the newspaper, so uh, again, like uh, Madeline was saying about uh, cruise control somehow being equated with everything or being thought of as being close to what the driver does generically. It's amazing to read old newspaper articles uh, looking at the analytical engine and people saying that the computations that this mechanism could do were just one step away from thinking the way a person thinks. And I think what is one of the things that's misleading in addition to saying that um, we have, in addition to saying that we're gonna have these perfect machines, but it's also that it underestimates the complexity of what people do. 
and these these sort of astonishing capabilities that we are able to bring to bear on perception requirements and decision making requirements and that really machine learning and ai are nowhere close to what people are able to do particularly in uh, when timeliness is is at stake and so I think culture, and one of the big things that needs to happen is a cultural shift. And a place where we've seen this before is in cybersecurity, where there was a shift towards the idea that every system is vulnerable. There is no amount of engineering that makes a system invul invulnerable. And I think in AI, we need to accept that every AI system will have failures, that there is no such thing as a foolproof AI system. Um, another thing is that many in many industries, the more safety critical the industry is, the more investment, just in terms of dollars, you see in terms of test and evaluation and verification and validation. In genuinely safety critical settings, it's common for these efforts to cost more than the original design. And I think that we should be willing to ask ourselves what sort of investments are reasonable investments in safety critical applications. And then the last thing I want to say is that my group also does work on emergent properties. And here, we recently heard that uh, these systems are very, very complex. And the more complex a system is, the more likely it is to have emergent properties. Um, but people will not always be able to predict emergent effects. Some emergent effects are trivial. There is something that you can easily imagine as a consequence of two different entities interacting. But some emergent effects might be very, very hard to predict. And then we're going to find ourselves asking not whether a company should have been able to predict those effects, but rather how do they respond to them. And with that, I will stop sharing. Great. Well, thank you, Madeline, Ryan, and Todd. Uh, that was really helpful to set the stage for, for our conversation. Uh, Todd, I actually want to start with a quick question for you. Uh, well, I don't know how quick this will be, but I think we heard lines of um, and what Ryan was saying and then what Madeline said. Well, Madeline uh, said it directly, kind of like a, these, these purported autonomous vehicles. And it seems like one of, the, one of the questions that we're grappling with here is to what extent is this actually something new and this idea of emergent behavior uh, in, in systems, things that we can't kind of predict. I mean, when we dig, we'll dig into the Uber case just a little bit more and many of the discussions seem like pretty standard engineering questions. I mean, how can we kind of make sense of to what extent is this, are, are we really grappling with challenges about not being able to predict how a system might learn and adapt its behavior versus more traditional engineering questions that we should be thinking about? Um, so I think that there are some, settings where we are dealing with very traditional questions and we can have the expectation that the industry approach those uh, safety in relatively traditional ways. Like, so for instance, I would say the idea that you could put a driver into a driver's seat and then have them not doing anything and expect them to not get distracted is completely unreasonable. Here, I unconditionally, at a personal level, I unconditionally hold Uber and its engineering decisions responsible. But I would actually say that the Tesla 10 cent hack is different in type. That they built a perception system. They built a perception with best known techniques, roughly, that in terms of what was uh, known in terms of machine vision and perception algorithms at the time. And then someone else cleverly started to see a, a loophole in the way the entire design pipeline worked. And although that loophole was very real, that doesn't necessarily mean that the original engineers who were designing the perception pipeline can reasonably have been expected to catch not just that, but all possible loopholes, right? The, the space, and I think one of the key things here is that with machine learning, we are explicitly embracing a technology that is very, very high dimensional. We're, to, we're using it because we don't understand how it works. And, and, and because it finds solutions that we don't know how to find in some other way. And so that comes with a trade-off that there's also gonna be vulnerabilities that we don't understand how they work and vulnerabilities that perhaps cannot be foreseen by the people who design the system. Well, I, I think that uh, you mentioned some of the things Madeline was talking about. I want to ask her too, following up on, on some of this. 
and I think you kind of alluded to the idea, Madeline, that a lot of these problems, it seems like today we're having discussions, concerns about bias, failures, and it's like, well, we'll just have a human in the loop. And there doesn't seem to be a heck of a lot of discussion about it kind of after that. I mean, what needs to be done to make, it, make this meaningful, adding humans to the loop? And what might we be able to learn from best practices in the past based on your research? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to speak on those things. I want to add one quick thing. Um, oh, yeah, uh, please what do. What Todd said, because um, I think I, I really, really agree and, and appreciate it with, I want to add one slight twist, um, kind of throw, throw this on the table um, to just make us like think a little bit about what we mean when we say unintended consequences, um, because we can say that you know, these systems are complex, they're dynamic, they're emergent, um, but still the kind of um, degree to which there is a responsibility by system designers to anticipate all of the different sort of situations in which a system might go wrong. Um, not all of those are unintended consequences or uh, they, or sorry, there aren't unforeseen consequences because if you'd asked other people about what the consequences might be, you'd get a different perspective. So I just want to say, like, when we talk about unintended consequences, sort of um, unintended by by whom or unanticipated by whom, um, and so that's kind of a different way to think about where is the human in the loop because I think the the human in the loop is often kind of inserted at the end. And so if we think about sort of continuous feedback loops, expanding out the idea of a human in the loop and saying, you know, are there places earlier in the design cycle where there needs to be um, feedback about like real world scenarios? You know, one of the things that was really interesting in the NTSB report about Uber is that the Uber designers hadn't sort of considered classifying pedestrians outside of um, walkways, right? So like, I don't know how that happened, but maybe if there had been a wider sort of set of people living in different urban um, environments, that might have come up. Um, and I think, you know, as as Todd sort of mentioned, you know, there are there's decades of research that shows that the handoff problem is really tough, and there is also decades of engineering. Uh, research that can help think about how to build redundancy into safety critical systems. And I think, you know, the, the driverless car industry so, sort of computer science autonomous systems going forward could really continue to learn a lot from, from previous sort of engineering safety culture, because there can, there can be a difference between sort of computer science culture and engineering culture. Thanks, Madeline. Ryan, I want to give you a chance to, to jump in on here. And I also wonder if, um, you know, please share whatever thoughts you have on this discussion. But also, I think there have been some questions in the chat and, and sign up for this about understanding the role of the law. And you talked a little bit about tort law. Um, maybe you can also touch on uh, criminal law just a bit, thinking about when criminal law liability potentially kicks in, too. Well, I'll take those in reverse order, if I may, Dan. So criminal law kicks in typically when you do something on purpose. You know, I mean, you know, think about criminal law. Criminal law is, this is it's, it's not just like somebody suing you because they got hurt. It's like all of us collectively are, are the, on the other side of that V, that versus, right? It's the state. And the state, as to paraphrase Max Weber, um, has like a monopoly on the legitimate use of, of violence, right? And so when you're gonna do that kind of thing, typically criminal law is gonna look for mens rea, intentionality. Um, so that said, it's important to note that in the Uber situation, um, one person's getting prosecuted for negligent homicide, which generally means that they're falling um, below the standard of care we might expect, uh, that they should have done differently, not that they did something on purpose. And that logic seems to me personally to uh, uh, apply, and it seems also to appear to Madeline and to Todd, I don't think I'm attributing anything to them that I heard him say it, um, to, to the, the, the Uber uh, team uh, that missed some pretty big, some pretty big things, right? Uh, things that were subsequently uh, corrected. Um, but in general, uh, uh, we're reticent to, to, to bring criminal actions in the absence of intent, okay? But with tort law, each of the things that we're talking about that Madeline and Todd are talking about um, have an analog in tort law, okay? And so one of them is, one question is like, look, 
um, if this is the kind of thing that a lot of people are doing and there's a good healthy standard on how to do it well, you know, build a normal car these days, you know, people know how to do that. Then we can say this group over here, they fell below the standard we expect. You know what I mean? And they really didn't do a terribly good job. But when you're talking about something that's pretty novel and you can't anticipate all the complexities and any and all that different stuff. And it's like, there's all these different interactions and the data and gosh, these, these researchers way across the uh, globe found some, some issue with our, with our, our system and were able to exploit it. You know, what we often say about that is, you know, let's just, you know, let's just hold to strict liability. If you're going to go ahead and do something that there isn't a very good set of standards around how to do well, no matter what happens, you're liable. The only major problem with that, in my view, um, and by the way, it's like often we do things when something's really new, we'll hold it to a strict liability standard where it's just like, we don't ask about who's at fault exactly. We just say, did, did someone get hurt in the right way? Um, we have to do that with emerging technology only to uh, ratchet back to negligence after we have a better sense of how it works. So hot air balloons are a good example. Like when hot air balloons first came out, like stuff fell out of them. They landed on people and cars and not cars actually, but they landed on, on, on the horses and cows and people's property and it was a mess. And so we held them to strict liability. But as we came to understand the technology better, we moved to negligence. The one big thing that's a problem is what Todd mentioned about emergent behavior. And the reason emergent behavior is problematic is that if machines behave in ways that truly are not predictable in advance, and sometimes they do, then you're gonna have a problem in tort law holding folks responsible because of a doctrine called proximate causation, which says we're not gonna hold you responsible for things, even in strict liability, if the, if the kind of harm that happened was not, could not be anticipated. But I wanna emphasize it's the kind of harm. The precise mechanism of harm does not need to be figured out. And in the Uber case is a really good example. When you build a car in a way where you're not you know, taking in enough care, what do you risk? Running into people. What happened? Running into people, right? If the Uber car had like gotten involved in like a high stakes online poker game and cheated, we might go to, we might, we might say to Uber like, oh yeah, well, you couldn't see that coming. How do we figure that out? You know what I mean? Like, so when there's truly emergent behavior where the entire category of harm differs from what, but if it's, if it's just that you're risking, you know, getting hurt, now, the last thing I'll say is that another interesting thing, the reason I brought it up is the idea of adversarial machine learning where a group of researchers or maybe bad guys, right? Are trying to figure out how to understand a system, a model in order to exploit it and make it behave in strange and different and harmful ways. That's also a problem for proximate causation because sometimes courts will pretend that what third parties do intentionally is not <clears throat> foreseeable. Okay, and so, but not always. So for example, if you park your, your car at the top of a hill uh, in front of a high school and you leave your door open and you leave your keys in the car and some kid gets into the car and drives it off on purpose, even though that's illegal, you might still get in trouble, even though they did something that like, you know, uh, because it's so readily foreseeable. Um, anyway, tort law thought a lot about this. And I think that the real places that we're gonna have an issue with, with liability is gonna be in truly surprising types of harms. Ryan, I want to follow up and just ask you something about that and then get Madeline and, and Todd's input on that. I mean, and so how, how might you try to explain, and I know, I know you're primarily a, a torts law professor and think about uh, these issues in a torts perspective and less maybe in the criminal uh, realm, but how might you explain, I mean, given these failures we saw that the NTSB found inside of Uber, right? It should have expected these things as more of an engineering problem. It was less of an unexpected outcome, although we'll see if Todd has a different take on that, maybe from an engineer's perspective. How do you think at the end of the day, you might explain why we're seeing uh, criminal charges brought against a safety driver, but it doesn't seem um, nothing so far has really happened with respect to, to Uber? As Madeline has already pointed out, this is a longstanding pattern. You know, I could point you to a number of different civil cases in which there was a whole lot going on and the court zeroed in on the human error. Another example involves um, a, a, a autopilot um, a flight crash decades ago um, in which it seemed to be partly the autopilot, they're not totally sure, 
why, but partly it was actually about the fact that the that the cargo had been um, improperly uh, loaded in such a way that the weight distribution was uh, against the rules. Okay, and the relevant civil authorities zeroed in on that and went after liability for the people that weighted that thing wrong. We're just more comfortable. Our institutions are just more comfortable holding people accountable for things, right? But the truth is, is that it's people all the way down. <laughs> there are people, you know what I mean? And to, machines don't come out of like, you know, the they're, it's not like in the loop or whatever that show is, you know, where machines just come out and no, I mean, you know, um, people are responsible. So, it, so, you know, one of the things I find endlessly fascinating about law and technology, which is that what I think of myself as a law and technology scholar in the end of the day, and I, that's why I like your, the frame of your center, Dan, by the way, is one of the things, super things, interesting things about technology is it tends to hide agency. It tends to sort of obscure and hide agency uh, in a way that is fascinating. So I think there's an equally good criminal negligence case against Uber as there is against uh, the woman who was charged with it. And I wonder whether or not she, was, she wasn't charged with it because she was in a vulnerable position as Madeline already alluded. Um, Madeline, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. But then I, there was a question that came in earlier too and uh, about when working with AI systems, what's the basis for bringing in the word morality into the discussion? And wh why would you say that's important for, for this discussion? Why aren't we just talking about tort law, for example? Oh gosh, well, I, I feel like <laughs> I'm, so as an anthropologist, it's funny, I, um, I, I'm not, I don't think of myself as an ethicist, although I, I guess I do now work on an ethical AI team. You know, I'm, I'm really interested and concerned with um, how people think about what they're doing, how group norms evolve. So, you know, I'm interested in morality, not as a kind of, this is the right way and this is the wrong way to do things, but as an anthropologist in my, you know, critical scholar perspective, I'm interested in thinking about why do people think the way that they do and, and what is sort of thought about as moral or not and how it is very specific to the time and place where we live and how it also often um, can be about power dynamics. So, you know, Ryan kind of raised this talking about, um, uh, you know, was Rafaela Vasquez in a vulnerable position? And also, you know, Ryan mentioned this idea of concealing agency. And I think that that gets to kind of where where have we thought about where agency lies in the past and then where does it now lie in the future? And I guess I want to double down again on what Ryan said um, around like it's humans all the way down. The point is not that we're saying that, you know, humans shouldn't be to blame. It's more about this is a complex system in which there are a lot of moving parts. There's, there's a lot of complexity. And there are a lot of people involved making a lot of decisions. So why should we only hold one of the people who's in that, who's, who's making decisions and in fact is sort of disempowered to make some of these decisions? Um, why are we holding that person responsible, right? It isn't, we're not trying to say that, I'm, I'm not trying to say that, you know, um, we should be sort of ascribing moral agency to autonomous systems. Um, I think we need to firmly think about the fact that it's humans all the way down and to figure out which humans we should be pointing to and which humans we should be demanding more of um, because they have time and space to, to think about these issues rather than two seconds to, to react in a high stakes environment as the safety driver did. So Todd, fo following up on that, I know one of the concerns in this whole space is that that um, tort law or new regulations might kill innovation, might make it difficult for companies or engineers to operate in this space. I mean, the Uber example is an interesting one because one thing you can argue there is that there was kind of a playbook for these things. They could look at other automotive companies and the things that have been done there for a long time and those things weren't really happening there. But um, I mean, how would you say from an engineering perspective that legal scholars and policymakers should be thinking about creating an environment where there would be the right guardrails to, to help foster a safety culture inside of organizations, but not to go so far to, to kill innovation? How do you think you can balance these things? 
Yeah, so, so first of all, I think that um, it's tempting to not view these machine learning techniques as new techniques when they're busy being integrated into so many facets of our daily lives. And, and, and so, you know, there tends to be a perception that every time it succeeds, every time my, my phone succeeds at identifying an object for some reason, that that means that the software is working. And, and then every time it doesn't succeed, we don't see that as a critical failure to understand how these algorithms work at all. Instead, we tend to interpret it as a one-off situation. And, and so part of, the, part of the pathway to understanding responsibility here is companies need to figure out how to better explain just so, as, you know, it, it, aside from explainable AI, right, just actually the company itself conveying to the consumer what their algorithms do well and what their algorithms do not do well provides a, a consumer with context for understanding what they're seeing. And, and, and so there, you know, the company really does need to explain boundaries explicitly because otherwise our general society love of artificial intelligence as an idea, just like, you know, that which is analytical machine or cruise control or whatever is gonna overwhelm our ability to think critically about these technologies. Um, and then I think at the other end, this idea of emergent behavior I mean, the, the, the phrase emergent behavior is, it, is, it should be different, even used colloquially, colloquially than intended or unintended behavior. That has to do with a person. When I use emergent behavior, I really mean, could the physics of the situation or could analysis have predicted the structure of what was observed? And I think in the Uber case, there's really no question that there was plenty of information up front to understand a potential failure mode that was in fact exactly what happened. That other people in the industry would have predicted that sort of an outcome. But I think that we should also take it very seriously when other people in the industry also say to themselves, yep, didn't see that coming, right? That, and, and I think, I mean, from a tactical perspective, the work that we do in my group, some of it is related to the idea that, that emergent behavior under pretty broad circumstances is inevitable, that there will be certain types of behaviors that are genuinely not predictable, even in just a purely physics driven sense. No humans, nothing that, you know, nothing at all as complex as what we're talking about here. And an analogy to that would be um, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge is like a classic failure in engineering analysis of a bridge that started oscillating and tore itself apart. And then, you know, decades later, the Millennium Bridge didn't shake itself apart, but it did start oscillating because of how people walked across it. And because of the fact that people synchronize when they walk together. And that's a purely physics driven setting where the engineers, you know, really bright engineers did analysis that suggested that the Millennium Bridge was a sound design and they did it in good faith. They were already worried about safety. And the thing that happened only made sense with lots of hindsight and lots of analysis of the thing that actually happened. And so I think somehow the law is gonna to have to embrace both of these realities, that there are things that happen at the software engineering level and at the design level that people should be absolutely held responsible for. And that they had every reason, there's every reason to think that they should have foreseen it before it happened. And yet there might be other things really happening in parallel that everyone in the field kind of agrees there, you know, that this system is so complex. Yes, we expect something can happen, but no, no one could have reasonably seen this coming. Thanks, Todd. Um, Ryan or Madeline, if you want to jump in anytime, just let me know, and I'll make sure you can. Well, Go ahead. I, I do want to respond to that. I mean, so so that is that is a fascinating example, although it does make me think of that sort of Bushism about fool me once you know, shame on you kind of thing, right? And so the thing that happened with them, with that bridge, because of what happened with Tacoma Narrows, right? When it happened with Tacoma Narrows, you might say to yourself like, gosh, nobody saw that coming, right? But 
that you know building in a check a specific check against that particular um you know tension by oscillation seems reasonable afterwards and so and so one of the reasons that we might hold novel things to a higher standard like strict liability though less is known about them is precisely because then we might get a sense down the line of what does work, what doesn't work, and, and, and so on. And that's a sort of well understood use of, of strict um, uh, liability. I, I guess this, and again, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in the kind of legal dimensions of this. And so don't say, take the words that I'm using to maybe if they have specific legal meanings, but, you know, something that's always struck me also is that in the case of testing and validation, which um, has sort of come up, but has, has not yet sort of fully been incorporated into our conversation and what is the standard by which people should have to validate um, their their systems before releasing them out into the world is that uh, driverless cars and and many systems that are ML driven systems built by large you know large companies um, are sort of constantly being tested and so we don't often think about the fact that um, Rafael Vasquez. Uh, or sorry, Elaine Hertzberg and the other people of Tempe, Arizona were part of an experiment that they did not necessarily um, sort of agree to enter into, although I guess their elected representative, you know, sort of did on their behalf, right? But like, what are the sort of, when, when we know that there's so much unknown, we call that an experiment and and maybe there should there should be you know higher standards when in when it's an experiment as opposed to building um something which which has had a more like robust testing period and i also want like todd to look at things in addition to uber in other words like i want somebody who is disinterested and and an expert to have the ability to, to kick the tires on things so that it's not just an interested party, right? You want you want to have um, uh, you want to have a, a like I said before an ecosystem. You want to reward, incentivize research, trying to figure out if systems are biased or unsafe, and you definitely want to remove legal impediments to that. So you want to have research exceptions, for example, to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, so that people feel at liberty to to look into systems so that to their heart's content to make sure they're not cheating on emissions or unsafe or like not categorizing jaywalkers, right? You know what I mean? Like you need more cooks um, in the kitchen. Yeah, I, I think to that point, people who work in the robotics field, the primary access that most of us have had to the practical driverless car pipeline is going out and test driving a car, and um, and you know, I mean, a, a majority of my uh, colleagues have at some point done that, I think, and uh, and it's an interesting experience. It's an interesting experience, but it's one where you're doing it sort of through a loophole of of consumer access. Um, the place where that really doesn't happen though, and, and again, I, at the end of my uh, brief introduction, I talked about the cybersecurity community where they've undergone a transformation that has been very helpful, right? That part of that transformation was changing their mental picture of whether you can completely keep someone out of your network, whether that is a plausible goal for the community and recognizing that there's just too many attack vectors, too many ways to get into a system. And then and then they transition to an aggressive model of different ways of encouraging people to attack their systems, right? I mean, they, they, they really embraced the reality that they were dealing with and then started saying, okay, now just as a matter of course, we are going to encourage people to try to undermine our systems so that we understand their reliability better. And I think that that's, it's, it's, in, it's inevitable that some version of that will, will be part of the future AI and ML pipelines. So we've alluded to this policy problem a few times. And um, I mean, 
one of the great things about federalism is you can have laboratories of democracy, you can try different experiments in different states, but it can also end up being kind of a race to the bottom. You want people to come test in your state, then maybe the, the fewest regulations, that's where you can attract. Uh, I mean, just kind of thinking of this from a bigger picture perspective, what sort of policy changes do we need to be advocating for? I mean, what, what are some of the things maybe that are happening already that you're aware of? And, and what do you think we ought to be doing to advance this discussion and, and make sure that we are putting policies in place that, um, that help us move forward responsibly? Ryan, do you want to maybe start? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, these are, um, I guess I'm the panelist with the most legal training, but it's, it's this are idiosyncratic to me. Um, I actually have a, a, a primer on AI uh, policy. It's a roadmap and primer on AI policy where I lay this out in detail. But a lot of it's just about making the ecosystem better. So I mentioned, for example, let's be crystal clear that you cannot get in trouble under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or um, you know if it's if it's a, a circumventing digital rights management under under DRM and, and to uh, you know. That you just can't get in trouble under state or federal law for for accountability research, for example, right? Um, another another thing is we need to uh, aggressively attract um, uh, uh, technical expertise uh, in in government and in institutions that haven't necessarily had them. I mean, it's incredible to me that the Office of Technology Assessment which used to help Congress understand technology was defunded in the 1990s and it's not been resuscitated, right? And sometimes the Office of Science Technology Policy is quite robust like it was under the Union Obama administration. Um, and sometimes it's not very robust at all. Um, and, you know, the different agencies, they need um, technical expertise so that they don't have to take industry's word for what industry is saying about things. Um, but they have to compete against you know, these huge salaries and these, and, and these attractive positions even at, at universities. Um, and so we need, we, need to, we need to make sure that there are a lot more sort of policy interested and policy savvy technologists. And that's something that my lab, the tech policy lab tries to work on over. There are other things, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna give you my idiosyncratic views alone. Madeline, maybe I'll just uh, ask you on a different twist to this. One of the questions that we had that was asked before is like, how do we take, there's been this proliferation of AI principles. Google has principles, lots of organizations. I think there's over a hundred now that have been kind of tracked. And one of the questions that I saw was, well, how do we take these principles and kind of turn them into concrete action items or uh, governance principles inside of organizations, for example? And, and what do you see happening in that, uh, in that regard? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a at least million dollar question, um, if not, if not more, you know, I mean, I, I think that one, I think that principles are really useful because they help us know what we're aspiring to and they set some kind of bar of accountability so that if if someone is doing something or if some program is happening, someone says, hey, you know, this doesn't quite fit into the principle, then they have an ability to say, this doesn't, this isn't right. And we've sort of said, and so for that reason, I think it is um, useful for principles to be really vague uh, or not really vague, but to be really capacious. Um, and I think though, when it comes to principles being operationalized, there is unfortunately no shortcut. Um, I think that, you know, really specific context, whether it's industry context and existing, I mean, um, not like a industry companies, but the sort of the, the industry, like the airline, the aviation industry or something, um, healthcare industry, um, right? Like there are specific experts with domain knowledge there and and that context matters and i think you know this isn't just about the driverless car space but in the kind of autonomous ai ml system world there's a lot of there's a perception that context can be flattened and it doesn't matter and that you can take things anywhere and i think when it comes to operationalizing principles um we have to reverse that sort of um reigning sense of what is important and say, no, the local, the context, the specific details have to be dealt with. And, and you can't make a big, huge generalized principle. Um, I know that that's not an answer, but that's that's maybe a way to a different answer than, than what general principles point to. 
Well, Todd, I want to get your thoughts and I want to give everyone a chance to kind of give closing comments. I don't know, from an engineering perspective, these principles that are out there, but then also um, what your thoughts are on maybe some of the regulation changes that have been proposed and, and what you see as the needs in this space. So I, I don't feel competent to talk about what the regulations should be. Um, I actually think that right now, broadly, there's a desire for these technologies and there's a healthy sense that we don't want to crush them. Um, and I actually agree with that. Like I, you know, I think that, that uh, when people get overly concerned about regulations crushing these technologies, I, I think they're maybe misreading the temperature. Um, but I think that certain types of transparency, and for me, I brought up uh, verification and validation earlier and it's come up a couple of times since then. Um, you know, our uh, I, Biden, President-elect Biden is 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 known for a, a quote about, um, don't tell me what your values are, uh, show me your budget and I'll tell you what your values are. And I actually think that in this setting, that's, that, that's a, a good way of understanding what we might expect from companies like understanding how companies invest in verification and validation procedures and test and evaluation procedures as part of, it, it's almost like an ingredients list for AI and ML. That if they effectively, you know, don't really invest in it, that's something that maybe the consumer should know before they rely on it. Um, but that's something that I think we could, you know, it's sort of a consumer protection idea um, more than a liability idea that that this is relevant to consumer decision making. Um, I also think that uh, to Ryan's point, just making it very clear to the research community the ways in which they are protected when they're doing accountability research, um, because a lot of people are interested in this, but I think it's it's very easy to feel hesitant about stepping into this arena because it feels like it's full of of uh, unexpected pitfalls that could have long-term consequences. And so I think being very clear and upfront about that is important. Well, I want to give each of our panelists just a yes. minute for some, uh, some closing thoughts. And I'll just go in the order of the, uh, that, you, that you presented. Uh, and I guess the way I'd like to frame this, but you can speak about whatever you like, is just thinking about research, engineering, and law. Uh, what do you think we really should be doing? Like, what would be your call to action for all the people on this webinar so that we can uh, we can really move make the progress we need to make in this space to have re responsible systems ryan i'll try to do this quickly um so basically if you take uh, if you take the universe of car accidents that you have today right and say that there's you know thousands hundreds you know, tens of thousands of them rather those globally but in the united states alone tens of thousands of them the hope would be that with driverless cars what you would do is you'd simply reduce the number of them, right? And so you just have far fewer. And then we don't have to change the law at all, and it's all good. And and you know we don't just it's it's a good story. Um, but the actual reality, as the Uber example shows so well, is that this is what's actually really happening. There are far fewer accidents, but some of them fall into this category that they wouldn't happen if there were a human involved in them. All right. So to me, the call for action is: What do we do about this? What do we do about that? How do we make that smaller? How do we uh, compensate people who find themselves in that part of the Venn diagram? You know what I mean? Like, so how do we talk about this with each other, with regulators, um, you know, morally? You know, that's the challenge to me. What do we do about that group of things that, that wouldn't happen with people? Thanks, Ryan. Excellent illustration. Madeline, I hope you have your whiteboard ready for your closing uh, remarks here. <laughs> no, how do I, how do I, you know, <laughs> How do I top that? I mean, it's just like, just can't, can't. Um, and I don't have like a cat to hold up or anything. Um, you know, I, I, I think this point about like, the questions are not just about technology. They're about where the technology is intersecting with existing societies in, in different ways. And I, but I, I think to sort of start to return to where I started, you know, I, I think there is a temptation to think that if we just get the technology right, we won't 
we won't need to answer these questions because the humans will be out of the way. But there is, you know, this thing called automation, the automation paradox, which says automation doesn't eliminate human error, it creates new kinds of errors. And so I guess I would sort of hope that whether it's in figuring out regulation or product design or even what the right thing is, it's not about trying to get to some ideal technological perfection and assuming that things will just be better in the future. It's about understanding where we are now and what the existing sort of fault lines in, in our society are um, and how they're gonna be reinforced or, um, or potentially mitigated. Right by 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 new technologies, you know maybe maybe we'll have less cars. Maybe we won't. That's not going to be a function of the technology. It's going to be a function of like broader society and government decisions. Thank you, Madeline. Todd. Yeah, I think that the the call to action for me is a, a shift in the technical culture. Um, and maybe just a shift towards always being explicit about the things that don't work as well as you were hoping they would work. That you know something not performing quite as well as what you'd hoped no longer should be a deal stopper in terms of market value. And figuring out how to convey that and sort of air dirty laundry in a way that's healthy and allows industries to thrive, but allows consumers to understand what they're buying, um, allows researchers to interact meaningfully with the technologies that are being developed. That's all I think something that has to happen at the cultural level. Thank you, Todd. Uh, and thank you so much for our panelists. Thank you so much for our attendees. There were tons of great questions. It was a real challenge to try to go work through the questions. Lots of really comp complex questions that I'll make sure to, to distribute to our panelists so they can see what the discussion was about. But so much interest in this program, so much interest in, in these topics. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Todd, for joining us. Thank you, um, everyone who attended. There's a, a link was dropped in the chat please fill out this survey, uh, you know, please give us some feedback on, on what you got out of this program and, and how we can put on even better programs in the future. Uh, but, but thanks again, one last round of thanks to, to our panelists, Ryan Kahlo, uh, Madeline Claire Ellish and, and Todd Murphy. We really appreciate the time that you spent preparing for this program and the time that you spent with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening and uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion with you all. Thank you and have a good night.